Hi, in this video I show how I created a PID controller in C Sharp and used it to create a real-time application to control the temperature of a system. I also sent the data to a database in Azure and made a web application to view the data using ASP.NET Core. The process that the system controls consists of an air heater tunnel using a heating element in one end and a sensor measuring the temperature in the other end. The signals to and from the system are connected to this VMOS D1 miniboard and it makes the data available on the Wi-Fi network using the Modbus TCP protocol. This allows the controller application to connect to the Modbus server and read the current temperature in the system. It then sends it through a low-pass filter to remove noise and then uses the PID controller algorithm to find the correct power to send to the heating element. This is also sent back using Modbus. If the physical device is not available, the Modbus connection can be swapped out for a simulator block. This allows us to test the ear heater process and also tune the PID controller without having the physical system connected. To send data to Azure, the application creates a connection to a Microsoft SQL database and uploads data to this on a fixed timer interval. In the ASP.NET Core application for visualizing the data, the line charts are automatically refreshed every second using a timer and it fetches the new data using an IAX request. Let's start by taking a closer look at the electronics. The advantage of using this VMOS D1 miniboard is that it is cheap and easy to program using the Arduino IDE. In this case, the disadvantage is that it does not have built-in analog output and it also operates on 3.3V as opposed to my ear heater control system that needs 5V. Because of that, I have made uh, some electronics and you can pause the video if you want to take a closer look at how it works. The program running on the microcontroller is actually very simple. First, it searches for my home Wi-Fi and connects to it. It also creates a Modbus server that allows other devices to read and write values to it. If you want to manually read and write Modbus values, you can download the BV Modbus program that I have programmed. You will find it on GitHub. The code used in this video will also be available in links below. The most important part of the controller application is the main loop that runs 10 times every second. What it does when it executes is to run a pipeline of elements that you see here. It works by first passing in a value to the first element, it does some processing and then passes it on to the next one. So in my case, I have, uh, for example, my Modbus device that retrieves the sensor temperature. It then sends the value to the PID controller, which then in turn sends the value back to the Modbus device. And the advantage with this is that it is modular and can easily be modified. So for example, if I want to add one uh, a low pass filter, I can do that. I can also, for example, swap the Modbus device out and insert, for example, a simulator. So this is all that happens inside the program. And these values are also logged and sent to Azure. And by the way, to give you an idea of how the code for the simulator and the PID controller works, you can take a look at this. In the user interface of the application, you can find the pipeline here. And you see that the same elements are available here. And you can also edit the properties of the objects inside the code easily using this uh, property editor. Right now we are connected to the simulation, but we can instead swap it out and use the physical device. We just need to enter the IP address and we can uncheck this checkbox. You then see that uh, the text is changed and we can start the loop executing it. And we see that we have an output voltage of 5. We can also switch to the simulation and start it again and we see values in the plots. I will get back to how we can tune the parameters of the controller later in the video, but first I will cover the Azure part. To send data to Azure, I just hook this uh, checkbox here and this starts the database connection internally. I sometimes get a timeout error the first time, but uh, when the database in Azure has been awakened, this uh, works nice. In Azure, I have made a resource group that contains the SQL database and also the visualization application. We can take a look at the SQL database first, and we can see it using the query editor. Here we are able to open this uh, tables folder, and you can see that we have a sensor table and a data point uh, table. So for example, we can look at the top 1000 rows here, and we see that we are continuously receiving data. 
So this is actually just a very simple database, but it is hosted in Azure. The data point table was created using uh, this code and the sensor table was created using this. I have also created a stored procedure uh, like you see here. This is used for reading out data from the table. An advantage of using a stored procedure is that it prevents uh, SQL injection attacks. The data visualization application looks like this and it has pages for, for example, visualizing the temperature and displaying also the output of the controller. To display this uh, line chart, I'm using the Google Charts component and inside the JavaScript code on the page, there is a timer that is refreshing the page every second. It then makes a request to a REST API on this same page to get updated values. If you take a look in the code behind, we see that part here where we are doing this Ajax table request and asks uh, for data at this specific path. And then we get some data in return and uh, use the field chart function. So this is relatively simple, but also works very good. To publish this code to Azure, I'm using this publish button. And here I have created a published profile that is publishing up to my Azure resource group. And I can just press publish and it will be ready to run. So here it is published and you see that the URL is an Azure URL. Now it's time to tune the PID controller to get good stability. As we see right now, the red value is close to the set point in blue, but it is very unstable. So here we need to do some tuning. On this kind of process, we don't need the D parameter, so we only need to tune the KP and TI parameters. We can do this by trial and error, but now we are going to use the SCOGI stub method. This method is an open loop tuning method and we need to set a fixed control signal for the heating element. We then need to wait for the temperature to get stable and we can then do a step change in the heater power and see how the process responds. Now it seems to have stabilized, so I changed the output from 0 to 3. And now we need to wait for it to stabilize again. This is good. And we can now press save to CSV to save what we see in the plots to a file. The CSV file looks like this, and I'm going to copy the data into Excel. This data will be used to find the time constant and the time delay of the process, and also to find the steepness of the curve after the step change. I then select all the columns and click on insert line chart. And we see something similar to what we saw earlier. And it also helps to scale the vertical axis correctly. The first thing we can do is to find the time delay and you can see from the plot that there is some delay from the time where the output was set to 3 to the time we see something happening. So to find this we can go to the line where the controller output was set on. So now we can count the lines until we see any change in the temperature. And I think that happens around here. So that's 22 cells. And since I know there is 0.1 second per cell, we can do this simple calculation, 0.1 times 22. So the time delay is 2.2 seconds. Next, we can find the time constant. And the time constant is defined as the time it takes for the temperature change to reach 63.2% of the total change. So we should start by finding the total change. We see that the initial temperature is around 26.5 and we can scroll down and see that we end up on around approximately 33.3. So the temperature change was 6.8 degrees. Now we need to multiply this by 0 0.632 to find how much temperature change there is until the time constant has passed. So I have plotted this as a blue line here. Where these lines cross, that's the time where we find the time constant. We can just uh, look in the values. We need to find how much time is there until we see this value, 30.8. And we need to start counting after this time delay has passed. So that was here. So just count the cells. And as you can see, that's 179 cells. 179 times the time step, which is 0.1. The time constant is 7.9 seconds. The next thing we need is to find the steepest tangent along this curve. 
So I will try to fit this blue line tangential to this temperature curve. I do that by changing this value and I just uh, test the different values until I think it's around uh, tangential. I think that's good. 0 0.438 degrees per second. That's the fastest change. I have collected all the information we have so far. But before we continue, I want to show that there are actually two ways we can calculate the steepest tangent. The first is by reading the tangent off graphically, like we just did. And then the second option is to actually divide the time constant with the delta temperature change. And as you see, we get approximately the same value. So you can choose the method you prefer. But for a more complicated system that has more than one time constant internally, there might be a difference. Next, we need to calculate the normalized tangent Ki. And we do this because we used a step change in the controller different from 1. The calculation is done by dividing by the time step u, and we get the value of 0 0.144. Next, we're going to decide the value Tc, which is the time constant we want the final system with the controller to have. And the usual thing here is to set this equal to the time delay. So we set it to 2.2. Now we only need to apply the formulas for calculating the Kp, the controller gain, and the Ti, the integral time. So we get the, these two values, and these are the ones we are going to put in to our PID controller. As you see, the temperature goes to the set point after a set point change, and there are no oscillations, so these parameters seem to work good. Since we have done a step response test on the system, we also have enough information to create a mathematical model of the system that we can use to simulate the system. The only value we are missing is the heater gain, which is the internal gain in the process from the input to the output in a steady state. To calculate that, we need to divide the total change in the temperature by the step change we did. And the result is a gain of 2.27. Here is the differential equation, which describes how much the temperature is changing per time unit. In this, most of the values are constants, but uh, as you see, the u and the t out are the variables that can change. The equation is actually very similar to the, a general first order system, the only difference is that the u here is not the current u, but we take the u that happened 2.2 seconds ago, and we have also added the room temperature here as a constant. I then converted the differential equation to a transfer function using Laplace transformation. In this, the first part corresponds to the first order system, and the second part corresponds to the time delay. Now we can use the transfer function in the control system library in Python. This is the Python code, and here we first separate the items above and below the fractional line. We then use the control library to create a transfer function. We also create a separate transfer function for the time delay and combine the two into one. We can then finally use the step response function to see how the step response would actually look. When looking at the output plot, we see a typical step response curve for our air heater system and it should have the correct time delay, time constant, and heater gain. The next step is to simulate the complete control loop, and not only the air heater. For that, we need to take into account the transfer function of the low-pass filter, and here we use a filter time constant of 1, and we also need the function for the PI controller. And here we will use the KP and TI settings that we found with the Skogestad method. To combine the transfer functions, we need to first multiply them together to get the loop transfer function, and then we can get a tracking transfer function by doing this. And this transfer function describes how the output temperature reacts to a change in the set point. I have coded the tracking transfer function into Python, and as you see, the process responds fairly good after a set point change. We can also try to decrease the controller gain, like this, and we now see that the response is slightly slower. The code also returns two more plots. The first one is the poles and zeros map, and here the poles are represented by this X symbol. 
the important thing here is that all the poles are on the left side of the plot center. This means that the system is stable. Since they are also using the imaginary axis, it means that we have some oscillatory motion, and that's confirmed by what we saw. The second plot is a bode plot, which describes more details about the frequency response. The values we are reading off this chart is the gain margin and the phase margin. If these values are small, we have a fast responding system, but it is also close to being unstable. So because of that, we want to have uh, low margins, but not too low. The phase margin can be read off at the frequency where there is no gain in the process. So that's here where the magnitude is crossing zero, which means a gain of one. And at this frequency, we can read off this phase delay. And this value represents how much a sine wave would be delayed if sent through the system at the specific frequency. And the most important thing here is that the gain margin is not zero because that means a phase lag of 180 degrees and that means that the controller action comes too late and can instead create bigger oscillations. We usually want a phase margin between 30 and 60 degrees, and in our case we have 44.55 degrees, so this is acceptable. The gain margin can be read off at the frequency where the phase lag is 180 degrees, and that happens here. We then read off the magnitude of the curve up here, and we read a value of 11.78 decibel and converted to normal gain that is 3.88. And this means that I can multiply my controller gain by 3.88 and the process will then be marginally stable. This means that oscillations will stay in the system and they will not be increased or damped. So that's the absolute maximum value we can use for our controller. But in practice, it's good to have a safety margin and a factor of 3.88 is reasonable. So that means that our bode plot confirms that our process is reasonably stable and also relatively fast. In the end, I have a few words about cybersecurity. If we start looking at the connection between the controller application and the microcontroller, we know that the traffic is using Modbus and thus it is not encrypted. So this is a security concern, but I expect all the communication to happen on a closed network. And if you are in full control of the network, this can be considered as okay. The next connection is the one between the controller application and Azure. The data over this connection must be encrypted and therefore we need to activate encryption in the connection stream. It's also important to password protect the connections and this can be done for example directly on the SQL connection or on an API that can exchange the same data. It's very important that the password system uses one password per user and not one global password. This makes it possible to block out individual users and it also allows the passwords to be changed. Since we are using an SQL connection, we need to watch out for SQL injection. Luckily, this is not easy with this application because it has no text fields that lets you write in harmful SQL commands. But to be on the safe side, I am also using stored procedures and these are also preventing SQL injection. Since the data handled by the control application may contain personal information, we also need to consider the GDPR regulation and let the users have control over their personal data. Here we could have looked further into managing consent, data sharing, access control and other privacy concerns. That's all I had for you in this video. We have now covered topics within Industry 4.0, IoT and Control Theory. I hope you found it useful. Thanks for watching.